Thank you all for having me. It's a quick drive up here from Mobile. I'm going to do something a little different today that I haven't done before, and mainly I'm going to give a whole talk about the Delta. This book that I've ba that has come out of this is called Among the Swamp People, and it's my first nonfiction book. And it's, it's fairly new. It came out in September, so I haven't done a lot of talks on it yet. And I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. I'm going to show you some of my personal slides from um, sh that I keep in Shutterfly and kind of give you a backstory to how this book came about. When I was about 24 years old, I got married and I moved to Mobile with my wife. I had always I had grown up in Point Clear, so I was used to having water in front of me. And when I got to Mobile, I didn't I didn't have Point Clear close anymore, so I was looking for. Uh, some place to put my boat in the water and, and, and get back to doing what I, was, what I was used to doing. And the closest thing to me, to Mobile, was the Mobile Tensaw Delta. And I had never been up there before, but I had heard, I had some friends who talked about having camps up there, and, but I had never had any reason to go up that way. I'd been in Mobile Bay all my life. So one day, I got uh, my first cousin and I, we went to the causeway which is the bridge that crosses from Baldwin to Mobile County at the base of, of Mobile at the base of the Delta and at the top of Mobile Bay and you'll see it there uh, the little pink line running along the bottom that has Chocolachi Bay near it that's the causeway I'm sure many of you have been across there and the whole area north of there is what's called the Mobile Tensaw Delta and it's about 260,000 acres of wetlands E.O. Wilson describes it as um, having more species of plants and animals than any comparable area in North America. He, he is a big uh, proponent of saving the Mobile Tensaw Delta and, uh, and doing things to preserve the, the flora and the fauna. Well, I, was, I originally got into it for different reasons. I basically wanted to go up there and find an outlet to hunt and fish. So. That day, me and my cousin, we drove up uh, from the causeway all the way up to um, a place called Chuck Fee Bay, which you can see Grand Bay. And Chuck Fee Bay is that body of water just above it and to the right a little bit. And it's about as in the middle of the delta as you can get. And there's no way into this place except with a small boat. The most of the rivers and creeks are shallow, and you have to really know what you're doing. The only reason I went there that day is because it looked like it was in the absolute middle of nowhere and I wanted to go explore it. Well, when I got up there, uh, along the way I started seeing all these camps. And most of these camps are not, were not very nice camps. I mean, they were all falling down and in bad shape. And that's just the way camps are up there because everything you want that you have to build with, you have to haul it up in your boat. So. A lot of these camps are very crudely constructed, and some are even weirder than that. I'll show you uh, one of these. Here's an example of the kind of thing you might find up there. Now, we call this thing the trailer park. And um, I'll show you where the trailer park is. Back on this map, you see that red dot way at the top. That's the trailer park. I mean, you would have to go way back into the swamp to find this thing. and so. A lot of most of the camps were made of wood, though. But some of these, I don't know how they got this thing up there. If it came in with a barge or a helicopter or what, but it, it's an old airstream. And uh, so I spent about a year. I figured out who owned the land up there. There are not many private pieces left. Most of it's owned by the state or the Corps of Engineers or a wildlife conservation groups. However, there are a few small tracts that are owned by private individuals, and. I, I got a tax map out and looked up who this person was and I contacted them and arranged a 20-year lease up there. And then for about a year, every weekend, I hauled lumber and supplies up there to, um, to build this camp. And this is the fishing camp that I launched out of. It's called Cloverleaf Landing. And I talk about this place a lot in my book. It's really just this old rundown um, fishing camp on the edge of the Tensaw River. And here is, uh, this is my brother-in-law, and this is a, a typical outing. Uh, we would be hauling lumber up, and this is Cloverleaf again. 
here we are just putting the boat in. We're looking across the Tensaw River. And this place, it's like a jungle out there. There's really, there are not many places you can get out of your boat and not sink to your knees in mud. So all these camps are built on pilings and they have what's called a mud sill at the base of the pilings. Basically, imagine like a, a giant cross. You nail a cross piece to a piling and you can drive a 10 foot piling down into the mud with your hands. And you just wait until the cross piece hits the mud and you may have a couple of boards laying flat down there that's going to sit on top of but basically your whole camp is floating on mud and it's all about footprint up there so that explains why a lot of these camps are always sinking and they look like something in a dr seuss book and you have to get under there with car jacks you know every year and jack them up and it's a lot of maintenance so this is me when I'm, I'm about 24 years old, and I'm, I'm, uh, you can see I've got a ladder in the boat, and it looks like I'm actually not working too much there. I'm, I'm making a jug to catch catfish on, and uh, that was a lot, of, a lot of what we would do up there. This is looking from the across Chuck Fee Bay, and um, I'm going to put probably some catfish cheese or a piece of eel or something on that um, jug. It's got a string attached with a hook and I'm going to let it float out there and I'll probably go back to the camp and start hammering something up and I'll watch those jugs and when they start moving around out in the bay I'll go out there and pull them up and I'll probably have a catfish or something like that. But I'm driving this old wood boat, it's a Stouter, and Mr. Stouter actually used to live up in the Delta and he built these boats that are still around today and while he was living up in the Delta in order to take his he trapped and he farmed and he would take his goods back and forth to Mobile and eventually he started making boats for other people and they got to be fairly famous down in that area and you'll still see a lot of stouter boats on Mobile Bay when you go down there. So this is looking across Chuck Fee Bay again and that's another boat I got after I, I beat up that wood boat too bad. And this is Chuck Fee Bay again. So I'm up there building this camp for about a year. And during the process of construction, it's not only just me and my brother-in-law and my uh, brothers that are up there helping me. I'm also starting to meet the locals who had been up there a long time before me, and I was the new guy. And so the first guy I met was this guy named Bart. And in my book, he goes by Jack. And I changed all their names in the book because when I wrote it, I, I thought, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in there that might embarrass a lot of people. And I thought I would change their names so that they wouldn't be embarrassed. And when, I, when the book first came out, I had the release party at the Five Rivers Delta Center on the causeway. And they all showed up, all these people in my book. And, and they're kind of a rough bunch. And they were upset with me because I had changed their name in the book. <laughs> So that, that whole plan kind of backfired. But the first guy I met was this guy named Bart. And he was two camps down from me. And Bart had had a camp up there his whole life, but his last one had gotten blown down by a hurricane or something. So he's up there building a new camp. And I stopped by one day to meet Bart and his wife. I mean, most of the people besides me were husband-wife teens. I mean, they, this was their waterfront property. And... So I went in their camp and they just had a plywood floor. And I assumed they were going to put something else over it, like linoleum or maybe some carpet or something. And I asked Bart, I said, Bart, what are you going to put on your floor? And his wife, Pam, she looked at me and she said, uh, we ain't putting nothing down. I told him I ain't cleaning them hogs outside in the rain again. <laughs> and uh, so that was my neighbor, Bart. And Bart kind of throughout the book turned into be like the wise old sage that kind of taught me, you know, like he probably taught me how to do the jugs better. And I remember this one conversation I had with him one night. I would go over there and, you know, drink beer with him at night when I was through working. And, and there was a sack of corn sitting against his wall. And these are the kind of the conversations I would get in with Bart. Um, I said, Bart, what are you going to do with that corn? He said, what do you mean what am I going to do with it? And I said, well, I mean, why do you have a sack of corn in your, in your camp? He said, man, all you need to survive is one sack of corn. And I said, really? What? I mean, like what? He said, I can feed hogs with it and I'll kill the hogs. 
I can make whiskey with it. I, and the whiskey I make, I can pour in my truck and run my truck off of it. <laughs> he said, I can make a heater that'll drop one kernel at a time, one kernel at a time and burn all night. And, and he, it was like Bubba Gump shrimp stuff. I mean, he kept going on and on about all these things he could do with that one sack of corn. And I'm fascinated, you know, by that. So, and, and I also learned that they're almost, everybody up there is making their own wine and whiskey. And so I got to where I would be going by camp and I'd say, hey, do you have any, you know, what kind of wine do you have? And they say, oh, we got, you know, turnip wine or, or scuppernon wine or, or uh, you know, I mean, I couldn't believe all the things they made wine out of. And so that was Bart, and he was the guy I would always go to, and he was kind of uh, real soft-spoken, really the master of the understatement in every way. And he told me, gave me a lot of good stories. So then the next, the camp next to me was this guy named George. And George was just flat out insane. He was crazy. I mean, I would hear him just howling all, like, all night long, and I don't know why. And uh, sometimes he would just, I'd wake up in the morning, he would be like naked on his front deck, <laughs> just asleep. And, um, and this is the kind of thing that would happen. And George was always, George and Bart were up there a lot more than I was. So Bart had to deal with him a lot more than me. And I, Bart would always have like a good George story. And t a typical George story is I'm sitting around with Bart and he tells me, yeah, uh, saw George last night, and, and he had just stopped. So I'm like, well, okay, well, I mean, wh what did he do? Well, I went, out, I went out to take a leak, and I looked out in the swamp. It was about 9 o'clock at night, and I could see him standing out in the swamp, and I could just see his, the outline of him back in the Palmetto. And so I could tell he had, he had guns all over him. He had a shotgun in one hand and a pistol in the other, and he looked like Pancho Villa with ammunition across him. And uh, I said, well, what was he doing? Bart's like, I don't know. I asked him. And I said, what did he say? He didn't say anything. And um, Bart said, you know, finally I just turned around. I went back inside and I told Pam. I said, Pam, call Sharon, George's wife. Call Sharon and tell her George is out in the swamp with a bunch of guns and I don't know what he's up to. And I'm going to go back outside and keep an eye on him. So Bart said he walked back outside and stood on the porch and said, George, what are you doing? George didn't answer. Said, George, we're calling your wife. George didn't answer. And, uh, and then he started hearing, uh, Bart said he started hearing, lee, 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 lee. you know, like a cell phone ringing. He said George started twitching. And uh, he said that cell phone kept going off. And finally George grabs it down. He's like, what? I'm busy. And, and that's just where the story ends. I mean... <laughs> And I, I'm like, well, Bart, did you ever find out what he was doing? No, he turned around and walked home. And, uh, but George had this, uh, he had this houseboat. He was just building his camp. And he had been up there all his life, too. But for some reason, they always seem to kind of come on a lot of misfortune. And they're doing, you know, they're moving around. And so his camp at first was like this Sears lawnmower shed on a plywood barge. And he had tied it up next to me. And he and Sharon would sit on the back of this thing with rod and reels, and they would cast them out into the bay, and they would sit there, and they would start drinking early in the morning. And at first, you know, you have boats that come through there, and so at first they're pretty good at getting their lines in real quick when a boat's coming by, but like toward the end of the afternoon, they, you know, they can't move as fast. <laughs> and so... You know, a boat comes by and they kind of stand up just a little bit and the boat will clip their lines and it just kind of sags down and George stands up and he starts cussing them and yelling at them. And, uh, and that was just always going on. And, and he told me he was going to build this camp, but he just stayed on this barge for the longest time. And I asked him one day, I said, I said, George, you know, when are you going to start building your camp? He's like, man, I'm going to get started, you know, but I mean, I'll just, me and Pam are just, I mean, me and Sharon are just enjoying this fishing and well, it was like a year before he finally got started. And, um, and all he did then was just dump a bunch of pylons on the ground. Well, then Hurricane, um, uh, I don't remember what it was called, the George came through. 
and it just shaved the top of his barge off, and it took his little pop, his little Sears lawnmower shed, and just put it right out in the middle of the bay. And um, George, I went to see, and I noticed George stopped coming up after that. And I went over to see Bart and asked Bart about it. And Bart's like, yeah, he says he can't come up anymore. He gets homesick when he sees that building out there. <laughs> and, uh, and he's been, and I'm like, well, I'm homesick. I mean, it's just a lawnmower shed. He's like, he just, you know, you can't take it. I'm like, all right, well, then over the next couple months, I started to notice the thing started turning black, like somebody had been trying to burn it. And I went, I, I go to see Bart about it. Bart's like, man, he's been out, you've been, you missed it. He's been out there trying to burn it. And I told him it's not going to burn. It's aluminum. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, Bart, we got to do something. I mean, you know, he's going to hurt himself. And Bart's like, I know. I told him next time he comes up, I'm going to mix him up something good that'll take care of it. I said, well, what are you going to mix up? He's like, I'll handle it. And uh, <laughs> so next time I come up, the thing's gone. And... I go see Bart again. Bart, y'all did it. The thing's gone. He said, yeah, I mixed him up some stuff, and I took him out there in the boat and told him to get up on the roof and dump it all over it and light it. He said, and he said, he lit that thing. He said, George was up on the roof dancing in the flames, yelling. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, did it burn him? He's like, it burned him a little, but he jumped off in the bay. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, the next week, George was up there. He started his camp, and it went on up. And he just had to take care of that little issue. <laughs> so then there was this guy named Murray who was a flat-out convict. He wasn't crazy. He was just, I mean, he was just a convict. And Murray, uh, the first time I met Murray, he told me he was going to kill me. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I thought he was going to. And, and that was like within a year that I'd been there. And I thought, great, you know, I'm just starting. And there's already this guy that wants to kill me. And he's real like... He's kind of, uh, he's real skinny, but muscled like in a squirrely kind of way. And he's always, he's got real whiskey breath all the time. He's sweating. He's just real twitchy and like, like he just might hit you like at any minute. And, and you don't really ever know what he's thinking. And um, so there was Murray that I had to kind of watch out for. And then there was this guy named Randy. And he's probably the last of the main four people I talk about. And Randy was sort of like, the mob boss of the whole thing. He was, he considered himself the property manager of Chuck Fee Bay. And he handled the, the rental or the lease situations with the owner. Well, I never knew about Randy and I'd gone straight to the owner and dealt with him directly because I didn't know that there was mob boss Randy. And uh, so I think Randy was upset with me from day one because he thought I didn't respect his position. But I mean, I didn't even know Randy. I didn't even know he was the mayor of Chuck Fee Bay, as he called himself, until uh, Bart told me one day. And Bart's like, yeah, he's kind of upset about it. I'm like, well, I didn't know anything, Bart. And he said, well, don't worry about it. I was, like, I was always worried about people burning my camp. So, Bart, I just don't want anybody to burn me out. He said, don't worry about it. They ain't going to burn you. I said, well, are, are you, like, are you pre making a prediction or are you offering some assistance? He said... Just don't worry about it. They ain't going to burn you. And so I took that to mean Bart had connections and I wouldn't be burned out. And, uh, but Randy, he was like the Yoda of the Mars. Like if you were ever going to aspire to be the ultimate Delta person, you wanted to be like Randy. You know, he, he would, there were stories about him, like his boat would sink in the middle of the swamp five miles from anywhere and he would sleep naked in the weeds and for two days until he like waded back home again and just crazy stories like that and one time uh, his his camp looked like a mobile home but i think he just built it look like one it wasn't really one and uh you could go in there and there were some bunk beds kind of right in front of you and then off to your right there's a low ceiling and it was always dark in there it's like a thieves den and he always had these buddies in there and they would killed all this stuff and they were had this big viking feast that was going on all the time and it was just a weird place and i would stop by there just to try to get to know him maybe once a year i would just stop by to say all right i'm going to stop i'm gonna walk in there and i'm just gonna say hey and maybe you know he'll eventually like me 
And I would go in, it would be like entering a smoky pool hall, you know, in a strange town. I mean, they would stop talking and, uh, you know, I'd say, hey, how's it going, guys? They'd be like, yeah, how's it going? And I'd just kind of go sit down and sit there for a while and they wouldn't talk to me and then I'd get up and I'd leave. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I asked Bart one time, I said, Bart, you know, yeah, I went and I saw Randy a couple days ago. He didn't, you know, he didn't really have much to say to me, but, you know, just, uh, I just want to make sure I'm not going to get burned out. He's like, I told you not to worry about it. You're not going to get burned out. And I said, well, you know, I think I'll just stop by anyway, you know, every now and then just to kind of, you know, be neighborly. And he said, Bart said, yeah, I went over there last week and I walk in the front door and there's these two guys laying on the bunk beds. And it was about 10 o'clock in the morning. There was one guy on the bottom, one guy on top, lying on their backs. He said their mouth, they had their eyes closed, but their mouths were moving like baby birds waiting for a worm. <laughs> he said, I looked off to my right, and Randy was sitting in this little low ceiling, dark kind of kitchen area, just sitting by a, like a card table, sort of rubbing his face. And, and um, Bart said, Randy, what's up with those two? And Randy said, oh, I made them some wine last night. They've been like that ever since. <laughs> So this is what my camp looked like, and uh, this is uh, that little bitty building in the back or, that has, it looks like something out of a Clint Eastwood movie with the kind of short roof line. That was there when I got there, and I, it was, but it was sunk down, and I jacked it up, and that was where we stayed for the first year or so while we were building the camp in front of it. Now this is a few years into it, so it's... Uh, it's weathered a little bit, and you can see I've kind of put some tar on the roof. And then, so that the building you can barely see the roof on is the bunk room. The old Clint Eastwood looking building is what we call the shop, where we keep tools and stuff. And then back behind it is a small generator shed where we keep a generator. Because, again, if you hadn't gotten it, there's no way to get here except in a boat. I mean, so, so there's no electricity, um, there's no roads. I mean, you're in the middle of nowhere. And I remember when I first had that little camp. I was in there and it's not insulated. You know, there's not even, there's gaps under the ceiling. Like the walls don't even go all the way to the top. And we had one light bulb in there. And I remember lying on the bunk bed at night and I had to cover myself with a sheet sprayed with insect repellent because the bugs were so bad. And, uh, but I was so proud. I heard a plane like way up in the sky and I was thinking, you know, I'll bet that, that pilot looking down here seeing this, that, my little light in my swamp box is so envious. Nobody's got this. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I was, I was really proud of, of having my little swamp box. And then I built the, uh, the camp out in front, which has a, like a pool table and um, a bar. And then the camp, the little building right behind it is a bunk room that has, it sleeps about 10 people in there. So this is a, a, an artist's rendering that somebody did of my camp from the front. Here's the inside of it. And this was before we had the bunk room because we used to have the bunks in this main room. And you can just kind of see the edge of a bar there. And so these are, this is one of my buddies from college and a couple other guys, uh, friends of mine. And we would have lots of people from the Delta from around would come by. Like at night, it kind of turned into a social scene. And uh, sometimes people came by that were, oh, that were fun to hang out with. Sometimes you, some people came by you would rather not have come by. But, uh, oh, here's, uh, here's Bart. Bart's back there in the camo hat, and that's his wife, Pam. And um, they would just come over and talk a little, chat a little bit. And he always, as I said, always had good stories to tell. And uh, here's just another view of the pool table. And so we had this big party up there for a couple of years in a row um, called the, uh, uh, the Chuck Fee Revival. And we had a band up there. And we would have these boat races called the Deltona 500. And uh, so that was fun. Here's the party. We had a bunch of, I was real worried about the camp sinking. And, but fortunately, fortunately, it didn't. These are my kids. You know, as I got older, um, the good thing about having a camp up there is there's really, I mean, there's no Marine police. There's no wall. I mean, you're just going to hurt yourself. So it's a good place. Like if you have kids that want to drive the boat, it's 
they could walk across this bay, none of it's over their head. So you can see, I think my daughter that's driving right now is probably about nine years old, but uh, I would let them put around out in the bay and, uh, and they just thought that was the greatest thing ever. And sometimes they would break down way out there, you know, and you just have to get in another boat and go out and tell them how to start it. And so my kids were driving boats from a young age up there in the middle of nowhere, and they really enjoyed it. What's the dog's name? That's Sonny. Sonny was, um, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but when my wife showed up with a Dotson puppy, you know, you have a list of things that you never thought you would have as a man. Um, and a Dotson puppy was one of them. And so at first I acted like I didn't really like it, but the, the, dog, the Dotsons, the way they are, they end up picking one person they like. And so Sonny picked me. And so eventually Sonny and I... I mean, it didn't take long. I, eventually, I really, like, loved Sonny. And she would go everywhere with me. And she was like a trick Dotson. She would swim. She would fetch. She would climb ladders. Um, she was like a circus Dotson. <laughs> so that's Sonny. And this is, uh, these are, this is my son and two of his friends. We would do things like this, go have cookouts in Crab Creek which is a creek nearby, and we would put a grill in the water. You can see a grill back behind them, and uh, grill hamburgers, and then we could fish, like, off to the side. And this is called the Crab Creek Cookout, and he did this for his birthday. Uh, and, and there's also, aside from the social aspects of the Delta, um, there is the fishing and the wild and the birding is great. Birders from all over the country come down there because there's so many different species. If you can figure out how to get out there, then, I mean, it's a birder's dream. And the fishing is really great, too, because you're in an, an estuary where all the shrimp are coming to, you know, to lay their eggs and, and spawning. And um, you have salt water and fresh water. It's brackish. So certain times of year you catch different kinds of fish. Um, you catch brim and bass, and you also catch things like, there's my son Albert with a redfish that we caught right near the camp. Here's my daughter um, with a, another big redfish. And so the fishing's great, and you catch sharks there. I mean, all kinds of stuff. We have manatees that come in front of the camp. Uh, I've been fishing and caught like a bass, a, a sheephead, a freshwater catfish, a redfish, a flounder, and a blue crab, like all within an hour. They're just, all the saltwater and freshwater fish are mixing together in this big estuary. And this is what another one, my daughter, um, Mary Michael, and there's a great big sandbar uh, in the Tensaw River, and it's called, um, uh, I don't know why I can't think of it, uh, Gravine Island. And we would go there and go swimming all the time, and it's a mecca for people in the summertime. There's boats all over it. And so that's not far away. We go there and swim. It's got these big white sand beaches. And it's really a bunch of dredge spoil from like back in the 40s. So over the course of 15 years, I'm up there um, learning about the Delta. I'm the new guy at first. Eventually, I come around and resolve things with Outlaw Murray and mob boss Randy in a unique, unusual way. And I was no longer the new boy after 15 years. And I write about all that. And this book, Among the Swamp People, is really a collection of chronological essays that I kept up there over the course of 15 years, really about the natural wonders of the Delta and the wonders of the people that you'll find up there. So. It's, uh, it, it's non-fiction essays, but it's, they're chronological and have somewhat of a story arc. And that's, um, that's really the history of how I got up there and what I was doing. I don't get up there as much these days. My camp's still there. And if I do go, I'm usually taking kids. I don't have the wild, uh, the wild guy parties that we used to have. Um, and it's really all about spend the nights. My daughters and, and my son, they love to go up there and have friends. You know, we have movie nights up there, and we swim and still swim and fish. And um, you know, I get invited a lot to, to talk about the Delta just because it's so much in the news 
these days, and some people are talking about turning into a, a national park. Um, some people are for, some people are against. I really haven't studied the issue that much. I don't take a side there, but it is certainly one of Alabama's most valuable resources, not just for recreation, but it's the filter for all the rivers that are coming down through the state. And so it's, uh, it's important, you know, to keep it clean. And I, uh, I hope I continue, get to continue to enjoy it for many more years to come. And I'll be happy to take any questions y'all have about, any questions y'all might have. Yeah. Uh, in your book, you talk about catching alligators. Right. Yeah, catching alligators. Yeah, that was uh, actually my boss Randy taught me how to catch alligators, and I was the first time he ever talked to me directly was I was in that situation in his camp sitting there, and they were talking about catching alligators, and I couldn't help myself. I kind of forgot where I was. I said, "Y'all catch alligators," and they all stopped and looked at me. And Randy he said, "Boy, I've been catching alligators since I was six years old." And I said, really? How do you do it? He just made a call. He said, you just get your hand like this, and you just grab him by the neck. And I thought, wow. So uh, the next weekend, I had my cousin up there, um, and I call him Connor in the book. His, his real name's Harry. And so I had Harry up there, and I said, Harry, you ever gone, out, gone and caught alligators? He's like, no, are you crazy? I'm like, no, man, I do it all the time. And I... Uh, <laughs> And so all you got to do is get, make a call like that and just grab him right behind the neck. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, come on. I'll, get, I'll show you how to do it. So we went out, and uh, I got Harry on the front of the boat kind of laying across the bow. And, you, you know, we got up on this alligator, and it was probably about that long. You know, it wasn't too big. And um, I, had my other, I had my brother Reed with me, too. And I kind of told Reed, you know, what was up. And so we're back there just trying not to laugh. And Harry's, you know, he's laying across the bow with his hands out, and we're kind of easing up real slow to this alligator. And we get right up next to it, and I'm, you know, of course, I'm back there with Reed going, Reed, he's going to do it. Oh, my God, he's going to do it. He's going to grab it. And, uh, and sure enough, Harry grabbed it, and, I mean, he turned around, that alligator's whipping around, and he's lying on his back. And Reed and I, we just can't help it. We just start laughing. And about that time, Harry realizes he's been had. And, uh... So he lets the alligator loose in the boat. And, and we all jump in the water. And, and then we're all in the water, and the alligator's in there, you know, scampering around. like. And I'm thinking, you know, that's a small alligator. I'll bet its mother's around here somewhere. So we all climb back in the boat, and I'm standing on top of the motor, and Reed's like on the top of the bow. We're all standing up, and we finally get a paddle, and we're able to kind of flip it out. I'm like, Harry, what are you thinking? He's like, hey, rule number one of alligator catching, whoever catches the alligator gets to let it loose in the boat. <laughs> so, um, How did you get the pool table up there, and what happened to the Airstream trailer? Okay, the pool table is actually not a full-size one. It's kind of one of the smaller ones you can get at Sears, and it comes in a box. It's still pretty heavy. I mean, it was probably, you know, 200 pounds, but you just put it on your boat and drive it up there real slow, and then we put it together. Um, and the the trailer park, I believe um, uh, Katrina finally blew it off its 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 mount, and by then it was abandoned. It had been abandoned ever since we found it. No, the trailer park. Let me go back to uh, to that first map. And I'll show you. I'll show you where Crab Creek, okay. So the trailer park is way, that top dot way up on the top right. And my camp is the bigger red dot right below it. And then where we have the Crab Creek cookout is that other little red dot. And then you'd see the sandbar, right at the edge, you see where it says GRA Island, that's Gravine Island, that's where the kids, that's where my daughter was swimming. So all of it's kind of in the same general area. Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen Dr. Doug Phillips on the public television do a couple of programs on the, on the Delta. Uh, he was describing a little uh, platform where you could put your sleeping bag. And, yeah. Uh, what's, what's the prospect that an alligator or a snake or a tensile Delta, a swamp panther, might uh, visit you while you had your sleeping bag on a little platform at night? 
you're going to get visited by alligators. I don't know if they're going to come up on the platform. Um, these platforms you're talking about, I'm in the, the delta is a big place. This is what I call the lower delta. Now the upper delta is where those platforms are, and that's where you'll find things like the Bottle Creek Indian Mounds, in which I wrote another book about. But there uh, is a huge uh, group of mount, Indian mounds in the middle of the swamp up there that uh, the, I don't know all the Indian terms and what kind they were, but I mean, it was a long time ago and there were thousands of them up there. And it was a big civilization. And it's a pretty eerie, it's like finding some Inca ruins in the middle of nowhere. And that's where a lot of those platforms are in the North Delta. Um, there are panthers, people don't see the panthers very often. Um, you're more likely to see like a black bear. Um, most of the big animals, black bears, hogs, deer, and um, a lot of the, then you have the smaller things, of course, that everybody knows, uh, raccoons. And nutria, if y'all don't know what a nutria is, it's a giant rat. They have nutrias up there. They're rats about that long. And uh, alligators eat a lot of those. But lots of alligators. You'll always see alligators. What do you mean? Is it safe to, would it be safe to spend your eyes on those platforms? I would, yeah. I've never heard of anybody, you know, getting, you know, being a snack on that. On the, I mean, I would say people do it all the time. Oh, from my experience, alligators will pretty much leave you alone if, uh, you know, they're they're not going to bother you. What What is the distance from uh, land to where your uh, your camp is? How long does it take? For you to travel there by boat from land? It's about, um, as the crow flies, it's about five miles. And it takes me about 20 minutes weaving through. I'm trying to, uh, yeah, you can, you can't see exactly where I'm, the landing I take off from is off the screen to the right. And it takes me about 20 minutes with a, a little skiff with a 25 horsepower motor um, to get out there. You said you signed a 20-year lease, and you got to be coming up on the end of that now. Is there a chance for a renewal, or will the camp come to an end? Um, good question. The camp, I've, I'm going to lease it to a friend of mine, and I'm going to get to be, he's going to take over the lease, because I bought another piece of property um, across on the other side of the bay, and I'm probably going to build a new camp. But I'll still be able to use my old camp. I kind of have a lifetime membership. But I'm going to be able to. I'm going to probably build a new camp at this point. What happened to your place uh, Christmas Day when we got 15 inches of rain? Uh, we got water in it, and yeah, we during Katrina we got six feet of water in the camp, and we basically just had to go up there with some shop vacs and brooms and clean it out. I made the camp so the floor. Uh, I laid the, I have plywood, then I have some strips of like quarter inch, like lattice strips, and then I have a hardwood floor on top of that with a few holes uh, drilled in the plywood beneath it so the water will drain out of it um, if it gets water in it. And it happens every few years, you will get some water in there. Uh, you're just talking about you leased this, uh, the property owners who own the private property. How much do they lease it for, and how is it dimensioned off? You just say, that spot, or is there any survey um, made to the thing? Well, I, when I went up there, I saw that old camp, that little box that was there, and I thought that was a good place to start with, so I just told them I wanted where that box was. And it, it really doesn't matter how much you lease, because you don't ever get off your camp. It's just because you'd be in the mud. So what do they charge you? I paid, uh, I still pay $400 a year. What if you just homestead on the Corps of Engineer property? Well, I, I don't know. I guess they might run you off. Uh, but you ain't got anything to lose. You just go down to... Well, I mean, if you have a houseboat, you could just go out there and, and be anywhere and just tie up to the bank. I think there's a rule you can only be there for, you know, 30 or 40 days before you have to move it. But you don't want to invest the kind of time it takes to haul all that lumber up there and build a camp if you don't have you know, rights to do it because, I mean, it was, uh, I don't know how I stayed married that year, but. Hey, uh, I was just wondering, are there any commercial venues where you can tour up in here if you don't own a boat and not a good swimmer or anything? There are, there's a guy named Jimbo Metter 
who, if you don't recognize that name, is who Forrest Gump, the movie, was based off of. And I went up in the Delta with Jimbo a couple weeks ago, and he is he is, does tours of the Delta out of Fairhope. And it's called um, 17 Turtles Outfitters. He does some tours. They have tours out of the Five Rivers Delta Center. Jimbo's tours are a little more personalized. It's basically four people in Jimbo. Um, and they have more uh, commercial, like bigger tour groups. There's one that leaves out of Blakely State Park. And I think it also leaves out of Five Rivers Delta Center. But you can get on a big pontoon boat with maybe 30 people and they'll take you around. But they won't go the kind of places Jimbo will. Is there any movement by the Forever Wild people to obtain some of this land? They're always moving to obtain it. And they've, they have obtained some. I mean, I think they will take any opportunity they can get to buy land up in the Delta. They already own a good bit of it. There's industry all along Highway 43, chemical plants and stuff like that. Is there a pollution problem still? I don't know the answer to that. I know there historically has been. I was talking about Mr. Stouter who grew up there. I've talked to his daughter before and she said she remembers growing up out there and seeing like lilies and wildflowers all over the um, all over the river on the edge of the river and that the water was clear and they had sandy bottoms and um, ever since they I think in the 40s they were um, they were dumping some type of waste material along the edge of the the Delta and she said after that all the plants started dying and so I know there have been pollution problems I don't know how much of it still exists but I know in the past whatever happened in the past has caused permanent damage you can see the Mobile River right there um, that's it where it says Mobile, that far left river is the uh, Mobile is the main channel into the you know Ten Ton Waterway. Anybody else? All right, all right. If there are no other questions, we'd like to thank Waukee again. Thank you. I'd also like to remind everyone that his uh, book, Among the Swamp People, is available in the lobby. Thank you.